Right, now I'm worried that I can... Uh, I've therefore come to a conclusion with the last um, recording that, dare I say it, wiping out all of Jericho, I still don't know about every um, man, woman and child in it. And I suppose I'm still not clear on genocide of the entire world population apart from eight people. I think it's still a myth. But at the same time, I'm now beginning to think that the myth is teaching the truth. Namely that you don't compromise. You don't... suffer for the sake of evil. You might extend grace in that there is some possibility of the other turning into becoming a saint. But if you're really faced with malevolence that's going to have unacceptable costs like they, they wish to wipe you out, then it's a case of war and hoping you can destroy them first. But that's a cold reality of being in this world of uncertainty and the consequence of not, you know, of some person's not coming to the conclusion ultimately of worshipping God by which I mean at least having the same values or compatible values with God that otherwise well if their views cannot be made also harmonious with God, then God would, well, remove them from the scene. That doesn't mean necessarily wipe them out. They could go to a place where they can be unpleasant with each other. And in a sense, that is the concept of hell, of course, or the concept of the lower worlds, in some sense, that you might go to if your karma is um, appropriately aligned to such a place. Hmm. That's a bit of a surprise. Wouldn't have thought I'd come to the conclusion that Such could be compatible with the nature of God. I guess I really saw God to be a pacifist in some way. And non-violent in all cases. But like I see God as never losing his anger, partly because my understanding of anger is to be so annoyed that you do things irrationally. Uh, not opt non optimally and so on. And then that from that sort of perspective, well, it's not applicable to God. He's presumably always doing opt optimally the correct thing. And and conceivably he could be angry therefore without doing the wrong thing. Since he's God of course. And still be angry which would then mean simply very strongly motivated to overrule opposition, which might be for a very good reason. A 
bit like um, we got the view of Krishna declaring war or God declaring judgment at the end times, at least if not on other occasions, as per Christian Bible. So it seems uh, at least reasonable to remove um, the malicious um, from truly harming um, the saints, if you like, <laughs> the godly. And um, that removal might not be, of course, with unkind intent in the sense that you enjoy hurting people um, which they might of course they, uh, they could conceivably be of that um, ilk that what we would classify as evil intent they just enjoy causing harm um, but it would mean that we are uh, removing them um, simply to protect that which is good if you don't protect that which is good, then you have harm. If you have harm, you have destruction and the end of what you truly value. And if you pursue that, then you're not truly valuing what you truly value, what you thought you truly valued. So there are times when, um, in a world where there's malicious intent, you're going to have to use some um, what you would otherwise see as evil, um, in that it seems to remove uh, the hope of um, the malicious becoming non-malicious, but loving and kind and so on. Um, of course, you don't have to uh, annihilate them in the way that we see death as. Um, you know, we see death in a secular way now as the termination of life, whereas in a, an ancient way you might see death as um, the end of being here and you go on to a, a nether world or another world or um, uh, different levels of heaven and hell uh, in the case of um, like the Buddhist view, you know, or incarnation type thing in Hinduism where uh, well, it, it just means exit completely from this domain, this um, dimension, uh, for another. Which, um, well, in some sense has been conceived it will be a lower world, but it's still a life of some sort, which presumably, um, in the grace of God, has some opportunity to recover from. You know, you can struggle your way back up the chain of worlds by um, uh, changing in the right direction. And there's some sovereignty assumed a choice in doing this. Um, now, it's not terribly reliable as regards whether the reality of it exists, but what I mean to say is that uh, to wipe out all life, or all of Jericho, say, um, is not quite understood to be um, the end in the way that the secular person views such a thing. It might be that um, uh, it's assumed and understood that what the um, legend, if you like, um, or the story is saying is that you're simply removed from this world. Now, having said that, we are talking about a war situation. I mean, you know, you're drowning the people of the world if it's um, the flood, or you're, um, you know, destroying the people, you're, you're killing them. That's a straightforward um, statement of what you're presenting, you know, uh, by the edge of the sword. I mean, it's a, a violent and terrible ending for, and the worry is, of course, as the onlooker, the, the secular person looking at the account, well, haven't you destroyed the innocent? I mean, are you really going to kill the kids and why and so on? And all one can say is, well, you know, with the um, the trust and the faith of the 
religious chosen that uh, well God's got it right in some way that um, uh, makes it right that he's authorizing what otherwise would be seen in a secular way as mayhem. Um, mm. uh, but of course in some sense it's understood that the, the secular view is from the religious not valid that it's um, it's mayhem in itself in that the secular view is seen as not truly treasuring that which is eternal, loving and kind and um, human and results in a nightmare world of uh, no God, no love, no hope and utter despair. So it seems to depend from what direction you're coming from. Um, and the two sides, of course, um, are not going to um, come to agreement. Uh, they can only take off one coat and put on the other. Uh, sort of situation. And whether that is true or not, there is an uncertainty that's plaguing um, simply being in this world. Uh, which may be why we emphasize so much in religion faith, which is in some sense a leap from viewing a thing in, in a secular way to viewing it in um, a religious, from a, a religious perspective. Both sides are concerned with happiness, and in that sense the Rosenberg uh, thesis is, is hopefully valid in that um, we all have common needs based on our um, sentience and mortality. And uh, we empathize with that, with the other party, across these um, belief divides. You know, one religion to another, or religion to non-religion, or non-religion to religious. Um, but in some sense there's a basic predicament of man in the phenomenal world of um, matter, time and space um, that means there is a commonality and an empathy and a sympathy and an understanding. And there's a great hope but given uncertainty it is uncertain and the uncertainty itself results in a lack of harmony. And the lack of harmony here in this dimension, this phenomenal world, presents to us a situation in which we learn, we experience the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And that is validated in that such prepares us for godliness. And an eternity as part of the heavenly host. So I'm saying, aren't I, quite simply, that being in this world of time, space, matter, mortality and uncertainty uh, gives us training necessary. It's a necessary evil, if you like, or not an evil at all in that sense, 
but it's a necessary experience and hardship to prepare us for the kingdom of heaven, uh, for godly sovereignty of fellowship in God's heavenly family, his heavenly host. And of course, I don't mean I've proved that. I've um, hoped that that is the validation of the dilemma of life as I see it. I don't know it's the validation because of uncertainty here. Yeah, but I do know that is what I hope. In other words, I'm confronted with clearly unacceptable harm and suffering. And the only way I can validate it is to trust that it is to some purpose and not to no purpose at all, other than uh, its current experience. Now, we only have the current experience, whereas hope is the vision, the um, flotation, if you like, with the consideration of conceivable alternatives. And um, some conceivable alternatives are very attractive. Uh, so attractive that they're worth working towards. And the working towards such may result in a joy and a peace and a happiness, despite still being here in this present domain of the phenomenal world of time and space and matter and so on. In which case I'm then arguing that whether such hope is reasonable or unreasonable, validated by outcome or not, its present outcome of joy and some peace of mind and goodness and beauty and loveliness and harmony and truth. The effect of such pursuit on the present still makes it the most favorable option to take. If on the other hand you find godliness brings sorrow, discord, strife, war, more in harmony, more pain, more sorrow, more fear, more dread, then of course you would abandon such uh, as not hope at all, uh, quite hopeless, and you would not be pursuing it, and you would be left with simply the suffering and the sorrow that life um, brings anyway, with no hope, uh, only the fear of what you see and experience. It is the case, though, that even in such a situation, if I take a secular person, I say, do you know if you're thankful, if you're constantly looking at the good, your life actually becomes happier? And if this is found to be true, wouldn't you do it? <laughs> you know, nothing to do at the minute with um, anticipating God or anything else, religious, anything non-material, but simply... Well, except to deliberately tend to focus your mind on what's good as opposed to what's harmful. That, you know, people that focus their mind on everything that's wrong in their life get more and more depressed and, uh, and unhappy. Whereas those that, whether rationally or not, focus on everything that's good, you know, well, 
Yes, it is raining, isn't it? But thank goodness we need this for the crops, don't we? You know, the typical, what we see as a shallow sort of response to life, instead of really dealing with the nitty-gritty problems and focusing on the evil and rooting it out. I mean, but even that, of course, um, in some sense can give meaning to life. To simply be battling with the problems as uh, in a totally secular way. Um, yes, it does result in wars and strife and struggle and discord and you know, but it's um, but it's giving meaning to such as opposed to no meaning. But even so, I think you might find, and, and I think you will find that if you did concentrate on some of the wisdom suggested by the religion, religious, you know, that you focus on the good and that you are thankful and that you purpose peaceful um, harmony and as far as you can, um, you know, that seeking after joy and peace and loveliness and goodness and beauty and integrity and uh, compassion and kindness and so on, independently of whether you personified it as God, as a goal in that sense, but simply as a goal that is worthwhile in itself, then I think um, you might be in a contradiction in that you're denying some root of religion, but you are saying that that which religion has personified, namely such qualities as goodness and kindness and compassion and creativity and joy and peace and hope, are in fact worth pursuing in themselves because they bring much relief from suffering in a secular world and is something that the secular can exercise. It's just that if it's not personified as God, they're probably not relating to such and, mit and motivated by such to anything like as the same level, and therefore they get nothing like perhaps the same benefit. You know, they may still suffer greatly um, compared to how they would have experienced life if they had pursued such values as personified in a super being, God. What do you think? Do you see I'm, I'm really saying that, well, you can go a long way and remain completely secular, but pursue the right values. And the secular person does hope this. You know, as maturity comes upon them with time, um, you know, they seek after peace. They don't necessarily achieve it. Um, they do seek after, well, that's not right. We should be caring for um, families. We should be caring for children. We should be um, trying to be honest. We should be ruling in a noble way. And we do have some view of what the noble way is, where there's justice and honesty and openness and um, freedom of spirit just to the extent that it's still a harmony and um, goodness. I think you can be a secular saint and I think there's been many and I think that's just lovely. I think it's much easier to be um, a religious saint though there are pitfalls, and we've seen them with the religions of the world, but we've seen pitfalls with the secular approach too, haven't we? You know, the, um, uh, I was going to say communists of the world, but they weren't communists, were they? They weren't pursuing true brotherhood of man. Some of those horrific dictators that materialized in so-called communist countries. Um, hmm. Well, that's a, a 
that's a good recovery from the last um, last recording and its dilemmas. Um, although even that was, of course, had its own validation and relief. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving such suggestions, guidance, clues, understanding. Love you. Thank you, Father. That goodness is itself the validation. Anything of you is complete in itself. That's the astonishing thing. And therefore the hope is that all of creation is made up of something of your completeness. Because you are complete. And anything that's from you has your signature on it. And all of creation is held to be from you. And all that is not created too. Everything that's possible and impossible. <laughs> is that a fantastic hope, Father? Is that the sort of hope that only you as God really personifies and enshrines? Love you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father.